Hey everyone, this is the first time I've had people waiting for me. Wow. <laughs> Hi, I was running late. Can you tell? My goodness. Um, so hopefully I didn't keep people waiting too long, five minutes. I like to keep to time. Um, yeah, today was a bit of a hectic and crazy day, but I am here. I am here, I am here, I am here. So, what's next? <laughs> Waiting for the people to come in. I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> and I am so late. It is so hot. I am here in my ice gold and green shirt. And <sighs> the heat wave is up. We are dodging tropical storms and all of that stuff in the Caribbean. But guess what? I'm here. Hey, Eden. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sorry to keep people waiting, but this one, I am, I think, I think it might not be too long of a live. You know, I like to chat and I get passionate. <laughs> but yes, so good afternoon from the beautiful and extremely humid and hot British Virgin Islands. And welcome back to my live. No, this live is driven by request. Typically, I don't do my lives back on back-to-back -back weekends, but hey, you wanted it, I'm here, let's get it done. So last week's live, I went over my approach to developing training for AML, CFT, and other compliance topics. And apparently, that was a hit. It was, I think, the most engagement and the most views that I had during a live, but immediately after the live, the numbers kept going up. And people reached out to me on, on LinkedIn via my business page, Igna Solutions Limited. And I had a request for pe from people on the other side of the planet to do an early morning live so that they could get in on the freebies and ask questions during the lives and everything. So I told them, you know, in about two weeks, I'll be doing another live on a Saturday, but it's going to be very early in the morning. It could be like five, six, seven o'clock when most of us are trying to like get in that extra sleep or something. Or maybe, you know, you're the weekend warrior and you're hitting the gym. I'll be doing it early in the morning um, for those persons who are wanting, you know, that personal touch. <laughs> so, um, like I said, I had a lot of engagement and, uh, you, you know, a done for you topic was definitely doable. So I put it to you what, you know, because I had views in terms of what I thought, but, you know, I could do whatever. Um, I am here to help people. So I put the questions out to the audience. Um, and on the link on the YouTube community space, I put a poll. The poll was closed. It was three days closed and GRC got 55%. I did the same thing on LinkedIn. Um, that poll was closed the same time. I basically published them the same time, three days. So they were both ending Thursday night, which didn't give me a lot of time to prepare. So I'll have to plan that a little better. But GRC was the clear winner over there as well. And the choices were governance, risk, and compliance, FATF travel rule, and TCSPs, which are trust and corporate services providers and beneficial ownership. So like I said... GRC was a clear winner. Now, this live, I don't think is going to be as long as last week's live, but the GRC presentation has been done for you. It's done. It's uploaded. The links are ready. And we are going to get into some of what I've put in that presentation here so that you, you know, you're not buying cat in bag if you know what that saying is. And if you are familiar with that saying, you know, drop it in the comments below. I like the engagement. Um, but yeah, you know, it's not a buying cat in bag if you are not um, from the Caribbean. Hey, <laughs> if you're not from the Caribbean, I, I think it's a saying that, you know, People, you know, you need to have some kind of understanding as to what you're buying. And I say buying because, again, I'm giving it to the first five who will fastest when that link drops. That link has a limit of five people and they get the free, they get the done for you governance, risk and compliance PowerPoint presentation complete with notes in most of the slides and references and links to articles. Now, that doesn't mean like it has 100 links so you won't be inundated. And you, the first five will get that for free. If you are not fast enough or you are watching this after the live, the cost is $29.99, which is essentially almost free. And I'm practically giving it away at that price. If you are a trainer or a compliance consultant, 
you could basically deliver this presentation and easily charge about fifteen hundred dollars for it. Um, the the live today is new for me because it's you know done for you, so it's not like I'm going through everything because this is like for you, um, and it'll be up for three days and then taken down. Now the last live I had the thing up for three days and took it down, and people were like, "Well, why 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 don't you leave it up?" Because the platform I use, I have a number of online courses and things there already, and there are a limited number of slots that I can use on the package that I have. No, I don't have the biggest disposable income in the world. It does have a lot of space, but I want to keep things fresh, right? Because compliance moves fast. Everything evolves. So it's important to make sure you keep up to date with, um, with everything that's going on in the world. Um, hey, TS, I see you. Oh, Iceland. <laughs> and happiness. <laughs> yes, they're there. And I have lipstick on my teeth, people. I was running so late, right? I did not want to be, <laughs> I did not want to be this late because it was like um, just chaotic this morning and it's so hot. And then what really threw me off, this is like the real life part. Like I had to get my tires rotated, um, you know, for safety reasons, safety force and compliance systems do fail if you don't take care of them. So um, yeah, so that was part of what I had to do. So um, right. So if you are a compliance consultant, if you're a trainer, if you are a compliance officer and you need to, you do your own in-house training, um, the, the, what I'm going to do is help build a library for you for materials. Now, if you're a member of Chasing Compliance, you're going to be getting this for free. So you don't even have to jump in on the freebie. I'll be posting this tonight to Chasing Compliance and if you're watching this and you're not a member, you're watching this during the live or after the live, consider joining Chasing Compliance, the first membership for compliance professionals created by a regulator to help you win a compliance. Yes, that's a shameless plug. But on top of that, the things that are in there, why I'm so passionate and committed about it, the things that are in there are designed to help you actually be better at your job. And what gives me the authority to say that? I have been in regulation for 21 years and I have seen so many regulators make some own goals. And there's sometimes when I've been across the table with a compliance professional and they say something and I really want to cringe, but I can't because, you know, I'm the one administering the test and I can't tell you the answers. But here it's like you can get to engage with a non-conventional regulator, which I identify as uh, in terms of, you know, what this is not legal advice. This is an, a discussion of forum with resources and access to me. We have meetups. We're going to be working on getting the meetups more regularly. There's a podcast coming. That'll be for members only because there are things that I can share there that I won't be sharing in a public setting. So if this is your first time here, maybe you got the link from a colleague, welcome. If we've never, ever met, my name is Simone Martin <laughs> and I am on a mission to help compliance professionals avoid those missteps as well as to help them become better resourced and address a lot of the issues. I like to say faster than it takes you to review a compliance manual. So lot, lot, a big mouthful there, right? Um, but I still have lipstick. Let me drink a little water. Like crazy. Mm, it is so hot. It is so hot, people. It's hurricane season and it's already active if you've been paying attention. No, before I get any further, let me get my usual disclaimers out of the way. I am a financial services regulator. I am not a lawyer and I am not an advisor. And the views on this channel are definitely all my own and do not reflect the views of any regulatory authority or international standard setter. Now with that out of the way, let's dive in. So today is the first, but I'm thinking it might not be the last of a done for you training. So governance, risk and compliance has always been topical and it kind of gained steam in the 20, like, 2010-ish, it started to gain steam as, a, as its own discipline. So it's governance, risk management, and compliance. Now, what's focusing in the presentation, because this is not a talk about it per se, but there are going to be some gems in terms of what is in the presentation. Again, so you're not buying cat in bag. Um, the topics that I've covered include global influences impacting GRC. So you have that macro view. You know, it's not that this thing just sprung up. 
um, the role of regulatory authorities in GRC. Of course, as a regulator, I couldn't be talking about something and not kind of bring in the regulatory slant. And why is that important? Because GRC does not exist in a vacuum and a lot of the compliance requirements and even governance and risk requirements are driven by international standards and regulators. Um, the requirements for resilience is another topic. So what I've seen and what um, different things from all over have informed GRC in terms of building resilience. So what should you have in your governance, your corporate governance structure, your risk management systems, your compliance framework to be resilient, compliant, you know, reduce operational risk, that type of thing. Um, we also touch on ethics, integrity, and influence. Very important because, you know, you have that tone from the top from corporate governance. And then um, GRC applied critical factors for effectiveness, at least as per Simone. And some of it is objective. Um, so the links and their, the articles that I've cited. In all cases, I have not cited articles because some of the topics are very well covered. So you might have a preferred media outlet, but a number of the things, like I can give you an example. Um, FTX will come up. It, it's in one of the PowerPoint slides. FTX will come up. Now, if you are following me on LinkedIn, you would know that I had quite a bit to say a few months ago, but there are so many links in relation to it, um, in relation to the story, uh, that that is something that will be distilled in the, in the membership in terms of, well, you know, we can parse out a particular article. And if you had a question in relation to that, that's for the members, right? But if you're just getting this on your own, of course, you can do simple searches to validate and use trusted news sources, Reuters. Um, I'm in the British Virgin Islands, so, you know, we might use a BBC or proximity to the U.S. We might use, you know, Forbes, depending on who's there. But there are some articles that are linked from different um, stories. Uh, and then the last one is the future of GRC, so the future of governance, risk, and compliance. And, of course, everything in the compliance space is dynamic. So it is always good to, I think, take a look forward. It is, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, someone, how can you project that or why project that? And I think it's important to kind of have a, a view to the horizon as to what is coming so that you can be more proactive and not reactive to um, to what might be coming down the pipeline. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. But back to the presentation. So it has been done for you. And without the title slide and end slide, it is over, I think it's either 24, 26 slides. The slides follow the rules that I listed out in last week's presentation. I didn't do a lot of graphics because this is a basic presentation. You might have your own graphics. You might have things that you want to pretty it up and jazz it up. It's a plain white background. Um, the fonts are pretty big. Um, some of the slides do have on a little more content than I personally would have on my slide. However, in those cases, it's for you to have an idea as to what are the connected issues. And again, completely editable. So you can break this up and everything. Um, and the entire presentation can actually be split in two. Based on the topics, you can actually split the presentation and have it as two separate presentations. So one where you focus on the regulatory slant and one where you focus on the governance and ethical issues and conduct issues slant or future focus slant you can split that presentation and have two whole presentations. Now, for context, a GRC presentation I delivered at a seminar held by ICSA, which is now the Chartered Governance Institute. And there's no sponsorship from them, but it's an excellent organization. Um, I am professionally qualified in governance, and I am a fellow with the Chartered Governance, governance Institute. But be that as it may, I am not going to toot an organization if I'm not comfortable with them. And I quite love what they're doing in relation to governance. Um, you know, the 
presentation that I did in 20, that was 2019, um, was the few, I think it was around the future of GRC, but it had a regulatory slant, of course, because they were wanting that. And that presentation was all of 12 slides. It lasted 30 to 35 minutes. And that was before the Q&A. So my session, I went back and I checked and my session was about 45 minutes in length in total. So with 24 to 26 slides, you could definitely get pack in a proper presentation to be delivered. And like I said, it could be broken up into two. And the information that's there with the topic headers can also be changed. You can change the topic headers. So you have the things in terms of like ethics, integrity, and influence. You can split that up to have a whole separate discussion about ethics and have that in terms of codes of conduct and all of that. You can distill that as its own mini training if you wanted to. But the background is plain and you know you have everything there to be edited. Now in developing the presentation, my mind drifted back to some of the experiences that I had. And I can tell you, what are you deleting? I am. <laughs> I wasn't fast enough to see them. <laughs> oh gosh, um, my mind went back to some of the experience I had. And I can tell you that some of those experiences were not fun. Now, one of the experiences, and I have to be really careful because as a regulator, there's still things that you I cannot talk about because you've signed an oath of confidentiality. But I had a front row seat, hands-on, deep in the trenches with many other regulators around the world in the follow-up with Panama Papers. And what I can say in relation to Panama Papers is that it was one of the cases that pushed me to getting a professional qualification in government governance. And beyond the fallout, there were a lot of other aspects that came out around that. Um, but to make sure that I don't run afoul of, you know, confidential, confidentiality oaths, um, looking to more recent cases, I can tell you there's some similarities and they have GRC in the spotlight. FTX, I mentioned that a little earlier, and it is cited in the presentation as one of the cases slash scandals. Um, the thing that upsets me with FTX is that there are a lot of people that conflate it with cryptocurrency is bad and exchanges are bad and it's evil. No, that's not the case. The issue with FTX is that number one, it was a fraud. And two, it was an epic collapse of GRC if it existed at all. I don't know that it existed. There were all the media reports talking about how, you know, they were in the Bahamas and they didn't have a board. And I, I, I mean, I have no inside intelligence on FTX. I do have regulatory colleagues that, you know, not in contact with them every day or every week, but, you know, we do talk. And I didn't have to have a conversation with anybody in the Bahamas in their regulatory ecosystem to know that the comment of FTX not having a board was actual BS because Caribbean jurisdictions are held to such a high standard. That board had to be approved. And then it was proven that, yes, they did have a board, but the board was basically um, window dressing for compliance purposes. And it happens. And I say it's a fraud one because when people are out to commit frauds, a fraud is a fraud is a fraud. It doesn't matter if it's a cryptocurrency exchange, a jewelry store, an oil company, a mechanic shop. It doesn't matter. If somebody's out to commit a fraud, It is that is what it is. And the fact that it happens in a regulated entity is just a little more painful because you should have controls in place. But if you have the tone from the top being set towards bad conduct and criminal activity, then those are the outcomes that you will get, sadly enough. So, yeah, I do really get a little passionate and upset when people conflate it with misinformation around crypto and fintech and crypto exchanges and digital assets and payment system. I really get upset because that is the future. I have a lot of um, I'm looking forward to a lot of uh, good things happening with that. But let me back up off of my soapbox. For those of you in the Caribbean, there's another case that you might have been familiar with. And maybe if you're not in the Caribbean, you might have been familiar with it because of one of the celebrities that's connected to it. SSL out of Jamaica, and that's Stocks and Securities Limited. That got into the news for theft of clients' monies, millions of dollars. And one of the clients happened to be Usain Bolt, which is the Jamaican sprinter and Olympian, set the world record in the 100 and 200 meters and was part of, you know, the relay teams and what have you. Again, I have colleagues in Jamaica. I don't speak to them every week or every month. 
I have no inside knowledge on SSL. Um, and I stopped commenting on SSL when the regulatory authorities appointed a new director to their financial services commission. I know him well. And I ceased commenting the minute he was, a, other than saying publicly that that was a really good appointment because I know how you know thorough he is and everything else, I stopped commenting. Now, pulling apart the issues in relation to SSL from what was publicly available, all sorts of things failed. And for FTX too, governance, internal controls, audit, risk management failed, failed completely. But let me ask you, did, are, were any of you following any of those stories? No, I don't think regulators are being sometimes paid to approve these companies. Now, here's what I can tell you from um, dealing with applicants. In, t in terms of dealing with an applicant, SSL, no, SSL was regulated for more than a few years. I had different issues with the regulatory construct, and I said that on LinkedIn. Looking at their Financial Services Commission legislation, I found several issues. Now, regulators themselves are bound by international standards, so there are certain minimum provisions that we need to have. But there, the Jamaica Financial Services Commission had things that I was like, what, what the French toast is this supposed to do? Like one of the requirements was that they were supposed to um, carry out on-site inspections of all regulated entities annually. No regulatory authority says that. None. No, no. And that specificity showed me whoever drafted that may not have had the best understanding of what the role of a regulator is. I don't know who drafted it, right? But I'm being like, this is transparent. Shots fired if you think it's shots fired. But I also looked at some of the other things that their commission has done. And again, treading softly because regulators don't rip at other regulators. And if we see issues, we're going to have high level comments. I've had high level comments about the US SEC and some of the absolute garbage that they're doing right now with the same crypto space, but that's a different live. If you're interested in seeing that, drop it in the comments below. But, you know, <laughs> I have my biases and everything and I put them out there so that you know where I'm coming from. But the Jamaican regulator prior to the fraud um, there were a number of elements missing. And when you approve something at a particular point in time, I could approve a licensee 10 years ago. I am no longer the regulator of that company, right? I'm, I'm, I'm working with the regulatory authority, but I'm not supervising anymore. Does that mean I was paid off? No, that's not what happens. Sometimes it's just like relationships. You are familiar with the whole, you know, whatever gender you're into, but, you know, for my purposes, heterosexual relationships. Um, sometimes people present their best selves. In fact, they present an actor and they act so well that they could get an Academy Award. And then the marriage happens. And what fresh hell I have married a sociopath. That happens. It's the same thing in a regulated environment. Um, you could license someone, they've window dressed and they've done everything to look like the model citizen, have the right people. Next thing you know, people are quitting and people are being terminated and all of that, you know, it is, um, it is telling. Um, so you're asking it from a regulatory standpoint, if clients are complaining that they aren't getting their money, oh, hell yeah, <laughs> I would be in on that, like white on rice. Um, so complaints, I have mentioned complaints in a past place, but complaints tend to be like the canary in the coal mine. If I am hearing a complaint about a, a client not getting money, I'm not necessarily going to inspect them first. My thing is to find out what kind of engagement that client has had with the company to see whether there is some issue, some other thing that, you know, they think they had money, somebody had access to the account, they drain the account, they think they have money. And it happens in banking. I don't think it happens as much anymore. But I used to hear about this back in the day with um, and, and that's why, you know, there's so much about elder abuse as well. That's um, topical. Someone who is now older, a little informed, the banking systems have become more modernized, they put um, son, daughter, nephew, niece, grandson, whatever the case may be on the account. And they were like, all of this retirement money 
that I can withdraw and they take up the money. And then when grandpa, grandma needs the money, the money is not there. And then, you know, they have a knee jerk reaction and write to the regulator. And when you investigate, you find out that that's not the case. In cases where money goes missing, you write to, and again, you engage. And in our cases, you engage, you engage and you find out. And if it is that there's an indication of um, money being stolen, then you all up in that sauce and Kool-Aid. And what happens in those cases, it may even be an examiner is appointed. In extreme cases, you could appoint an administrator to actually take over the operations from the management so that now you have control of the assets. Offshore banking does not exist in the British Virgin Islands. I do know it exists in a number of jurisdictions. Um, that could be a topic all by itself. Um, the offshore banking, as it as a term is no more based on the connectivity with the rest of the world offshore banking is no longer a thing and it's a misnomer so what you would have is that in some jurisdictions they had banks that were established they were licensed by regulators but they were operating in other jurisdictions that pretty much went away in the 1990s and early 2000s there are some jurisdictions that still try to hang on to it but there are a number of international standards and developments from both FATF and the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision that has rendered those things moot but what happens is that you have a lot of people in the public who are not aware of those nuanced regulatory requirements and think that offshore banking is still a thing. So no, <laughs> it, it's not a thing. If you have a bank that's operating and licensed in a particular jurisdiction, or it's licensed in one jurisdiction operating in multiple jurisdictions, those multiple jurisdictions also have to issue licenses. And those multiple jurisdictions would meet up for a college of regulators to go over the issues with the bank. So that's why like the term offshore banking is a misnomer. It's, it's just a misnomer. Banco Popular, First Bank, First Caribbean, those are banks operating in the British Virgin Islands. They're not offshore banks. But some people will conflate them because they think BVI is an offshore jurisdiction and they use terms like tax haven, not even understanding that we pay some of more, more taxes than most of these you know, G20 countries. I'm on a soapbox. Let me stop. First question, yes, it would trigger an on-site examination. I don't know if you wanted me to give a shameless plug on the course I have in relation to the on-site inspection insight course that helps people prepare for that. But um, there are a lot of different actions that could be taken. What you do do is act really quickly because if money is going missing, regulators have to basically like, like we're not happy because now we probably have 18 hour days. And you're trying to do this work very quickly to, if there's money being stolen, to stem that tide. That helps? Come on, I am. I want to hear you. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. So, yeah. So, okay. So the little segue on offshore banking and theft of money i think now might be a decent enough time to drop the link what do you think i need some engagement yes it helps is it a good time to drop the link i'm waiting to hear or i could just go on talking <laughs> i want to make sure that people are on already happiness is it a good time to drop the link ts this is a good time to drop the link Let me take a sip of water, y'all. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm gonna drop it in the chat. All right, three, two, one. There we go, dropped in the chat the fastest five. You're in, you're on. Go for it. Now you don't need a code, just click the link. But yes, so if you're finding, so while people are scrambling to get in on that, if you're finding this helpful, um, I love the thumbs up. Please do share it with your friends if you haven't already. I see that so many of you have liked the video. If you are one of them that didn't like it, please do like it because <laughs> it helps. I think it helps. And um, you know, better clarity on compliance issues like that question on offshore banking and theft of money and what regulators would do. 
That's the kind of question I actually enjoy answering because it clears up a lot of things in the space around compliance that, <laughs> yay. And you see, TS is, he's in the membership. He's already getting all the benefits, people. <laughs> but um, this is the kind of information that I think can help, even if you're not in compliance, if you're thinking about a job in compliance, I think it will give context to a lot of the things that happen. And so you don't have misinformation. And so that people are not going to fool you. Like one of my biggest pet peeves is you go to the bank and you're required to do your due diligence. And they say, oh, it's because, you know, the regulator requires it. No, 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 no. The law requires it. And when you go and tell people that it's the regulator requiring it, it makes me feel that you don't understand the law and maybe I need to flag you for inspection. That's what my takeaway is. You have not properly trained your staff and they're either using this cop out or they're not really aware of what the law requires. Either which way an inspection could fix all of that for you. Do you want that as your outcome? I think not. I think that we need to have a bit more honesty as it relates to what the role of the regulator is. And don't feel bad, but as an unconventional regulator, sometimes I get into it with other regulators. So, you know, I get into it and, and my I'm, I'm firm on certain positions. I, um, I keep an open mind, but if I am of the view that something is not right, I'm going to tell you, even if you're another regulator. That's the world we live in. I think that we need to have that healthy discussion about certain things. And validation is, is useful for people to make decisions. And certainty. Like, you know, be certain about why you have certain things in the, um, certain things in law. But get off the soapbox. So this done for you presentation did take me a bit of work. <laughs> Um, but having done presentations for a number of years, looking back more than 13 years, actually, I don't think a year has gone by in the last 13 years where I did not draft a presentation for something, whether for myself or for someone, um, and, you know, de whether deliver at conferences or training other regulators or industry engagements um and i've had um, one or two opportunities to engage with in like present at an international standard setting body i mean there was one place i went to that is on those uh, you know down the planet <laughs> the, I, you know it took a while to get to it was not australia or new zealand but i think the opposite side of the planet and i got i went to the country for less than 72 hours to deliver a presentation and the reason why was I, i'm really proud of this personally though it was because i developed a concept that was going to be adopted by international standard setters and because i developed the concept i was the one to present it because you know you want to people wanted to interrogate this thing that i did it's in the regulatory community it's not something that is in the regulated community, but it filters down. Um, I've also assisted with thematic inspections in other jurisdictions outside of the Caribbean um, years ago. And in terms of, you know, shaping that and, you know, just having discussions and not necessarily like drafting the whole thing for them, but the the muscle memory that I'm speaking on and uh, the things that I've done, I've, I've worked in a number of different sectors in my regulatory career. I started out in securities, investment business, mutual funds. Then I moved to banking and fiduciary. Then I had a stint in, well, I had two stints in insurance. And then I was the head of enforcement. And then I went on secondment to Anguilla. Um, and I got to play in everything and including digital assets and then got, you know, certification with, a particular university in the UK for fintech and regulatory. And so I think my experience has allowed me to apply a bit of design thinking to presentations. And prior to regulatory presentations and AML, CFT presentations, I was a jump faculty at our local community college teaching business and, um, business classes, undergraduate business classes. Um, fun fact, I don't list it on my LinkedIn profile, but I do have a master's. I do have postgraduate education. So, and I 
get those flyers all the time, but I don't list it, but it's, you know, it's there. And so I have always been passionate about the education and, and the learning process. I am always wanting to learn the tragedy that happened in the news involving a particular submersible like that is, so I'm looking at that from a postmortem, sorry if it sounds morbid, but this is not meant to be like any slight, but even to aviation and other things, when you have these catastrophic failures of, of aircraft, the Boeing 737 MAX 8, you know, when, when I was looking at that, I looked at it from compliance and a regulatory perspective and what went wrong. And especially in those cases in the GRC framework, those are cases that are not in the traditional financial services, but they're lessons that can be learned from those spaces as well. Um, so the design thinking is, you know, I think what helps me to be able to crack out some of these um, and these presentations. The tips that I gave from last week's live will help you to deliver this presentation as well. So I was thinking about some of the things that I said last week in relation to the PowerPoint presentation. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're just jumping in on the live, um, some of the slides are a little heavier than I would typically have them for myself. But because I am creating this for other people and I don't know, you know, I don't know the people's circumstances, um, I have put certain things on one slide so that you can see the linkages and see the notes and then decide how you want to break it up. Because depending on your perspective, you would maybe attack it from a different angle. So that's why those would be um, those would be that way. But one thing I do need from all of you is feedback, please. Is this something you want more of? Would nothing, you know, I mean, you know, a done for you presentation, I think adds value to the job. Um, whether you are a compliance officer, consultant, whatever, or you're just doing it for your own education, because the information in the slides are enough for you to kind of distill and take away, even if you're not delivering it to anyone. So let me know in the comments, please, while we're here. Or if you're shy, you know, you could DM me um, in, at, at, well, on LinkedIn, on my personal profile. That would be an easier way to get at me, right? So more, so yes to more do done for you presentations, yes or no? Just drop it in the chat. Let me know, yes or no, whether this is something you want to see more of. And I'll put out the next poll and give myself more time so I'm not, like, not scrambling <laughs> to get this out. I see one yes. Thank you, Gabriel. Hi. Anybody else wants more of this done for you presentation? Or are we just chilling? Chilling like villains. Yes. All right. Well, of course, the members will get it for free, TS. So membership does have its privileges. Um, so while I wait for you to let me know whether you really want this, you know, <laughs> um, um, let me dive back into some of the topics. So ethics, integrity, and influence. Um, one of the cases is also in the, in, the, uh, in the slide, in the PowerPoint presentation, is Wells Fargo. The Wells Fargo, now Wells Fargo every so often has a hold my bear moment where it's like, oh, this scandal happened. It can't get any worse. And Wells Fargo is like, yeah, hold my bear. I'll be right back. And it's like, what? The French toast just happened. So Wells Fargo had a, a whole sales incentive, sales incentive, where they were creating fictitious accounts. And this was something that was sanctioned by management. Now, it blew up in epic proportion. And there was a congressional hearing with the CEO. Um, I think it's Larry Sh he had a strange last name. And he came, he had a little cast on his hand because he had a little slip and fall while well, playing with his grandkids at his million dollar mansion on the weekend prior. True story. I am not even making that part up because he mentioned it. And the, the members of the Congress were engaging, asking about this because, you know, a lot of people had harm done to them. Credit cards were open and accounts were open under people's names, real people, without their knowledge. And their credit scores went down. If you know anything about the U.S. and credit scores, credit scores will be the thing that decides whether you get a good loan or no loan <laughs> um, in some cases. And he was there and he was looking annoyed to be there. Like, how dare you call me? Anyways, follow fast forward. There was shareholder activism. 
that basically led to his removal and the removal of other directors and senior managers who were complicit in this. There were compliance professionals in Wells Fargo who were fired for raising concerns about it. They were awarded some sort of monies. It took a couple of years, but um, some of the actions happened faster than others. The same group CEO, um, he was terminated and he was like, you know, it, I am now fictionalizing it to say, fine, you know, like I'll leave under disgrace with my, I think it was, it. don't quote me, but it, I think it was more than $30 million in um, bonuses. He, he, he got like bank, real money for the bonuses. So I'm seeing the more done for you. Yes, yes, good stuff. All right, we'll be back with that. So he had lots of money that he was getting from, all right, they had this bad behavior, but hey, I still made money. And the shareholder activism got to the point where it was like, no, 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 no. We climbed this back. And this individual, in addition to some other managers who made serious bonuses from this bad activity, had them clawed back. One of the things that emerged from that particular case, but there were others around the world. I know there was one in the UK, but the name of the company doesn't come to mind, is that regulators are paying closer attention to incentive schemes because it drives it drives behavior, right? So I have something on my, one of the nice little quotes that I put up on my status, on my WhatsApp status from time to time is, um, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome or something like that. It's somebody who said this, the quote, uh, business magnet. Um, so what is happening is that regulators are actually putting into law, like, okay, yeah, pay him a hundred million dollars, but he can't get that money until after five years, he or she can't get that money after five years after they leave, because we need to see that they didn't open the gates of hell to make all of this profit and then leave the company and the regulators with the issues to clean up. So that is another factor that is featured in there. Um, I think that the ethics part of it is also a big one. Um, so I've mentioned this on LinkedIn before, and FTX is a good case for it again. Um, on LinkedIn, I had a post about, and some I think on a conference I spoke at, the future regulatory challenge will be the fit and proper assessment. Fit and proper is also covered a bit in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and there are other places where you could find fit and proper tests. This is basically based off of an international requirement for regulatory constructs, where you assess directors and senior managers, senior officers, or key persons. They might have different names, but essentially the same people. Um, you have to assess them for whether they have the skills, knowledge, and expertise, whether they are honest <laughs> and have integrity. So basically, you know... You aren't lying. You you aren't involved in and you might be thinking like, how do you assess that? You can't assess that um, because there's certain declarations that you make in the application. That's one, just one facet of it. And financial soundness. You aren't an undischarged bankrupt. You didn't run your finance, your personal finances or other finances into the ground. But the first tier, skills, knowledge, and expertise, is going to be very difficult to assess in the age of fintech because you have entrepreneurs who are launching startups at 20 they've been coding since they've been nine they may or may not have gone to um college so they may not they may not or might be college dropouts so they don't have a standardized set of tests that were administered in a setting for you to assess okay they have a degree in this so they've gone through this and they have this particular qualifications to be released upon the wall. If you're familiar with the tech, tech space and IT space, you would know that certifications are everything. So they'll get Scrum this and you know all these different things. Um, they might be coding exports on that. And from that, they have the experience. Do they have experience for running a firm? I would venture to say at 19 years old, no, but they can contribute and you would need diversity on the board. This is their idea. They have this, this thought. They have this brilliant idea. It is the next, you know, top 30 under 30. But then you have to look at that. Look at Theranos and the woman who was behind this company. Again, another fraud. But you have people who realize that, okay, because something is innovative and people don't understand it, I can sell them this down the river 
and then move on before they realize that I don't know what I'm talking about. Or they might just not have any understanding of certain business modalities that would come to somebody who's maybe twice their age, sorry to say it, uh, or maybe, you know, just a few years older and a few more years of experience. They might not have that um, to run a farm and the assessment of fit and proper. So, uh, you know, how do I give oversight to somebody who can code their way out of segregation of clients' monies? What controls do I put? And there are controls you put in. You hire the right people. You make sure you have, you know, whether it's a analytics form, a, um, data analytics form, uh, IT form, independent assessment, audit. There are different things that are popping up to address all of these issues. But getting them in at the corporate governance level, the board level, is going to be difficult. So that's one of the areas where I see a challenge for regulators in the brave new world. And so there's also a, a few slides on the future of governance. And I actually wrote a blog on this in 2021, in October 2021. And the views I set out there are still relevant. And, you know, feel free to use the contents of the blog because they have citations as well um, in terms of where we go from here. Um, and so I have a vision of the future of regulation. And the vision is changing slightly as the years progress. But... Again, the governance function of regulated firms is one of those things that I have been stressing needed to change and how we as regulators approach it needs to change why. When you go and inspect a company, you inspect their processes, their records. I've inspected companies. I heard I have a reputation when I inspect companies. I don't miss anything, but I want to think that means I'm, I was decent at my job when I did inspections. And my caveat was at the time, I don't do inspection, like a few years back, I stopped doing on-site inspections. Um, and I told people, if you ever saw me come out to do an inspection of a company, of a regulated entity, know that something is wrong. Because I ain't coming out. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can be delegated to do this, but I ain't coming out unless the problem is a real problem. And... In inspecting companies, you can have the best procedures. I have seen this for myself. But if it is that they just have the bloody thing as a paperweight and you go in there and you see what fresh hell, guess what? I am not penalized. Why, why penalize the company and the shareholders who are putting their trust in directors? You don't have good or bad companies, just like you don't have good or bad countries. This is another thing when we, with US and sanctions and OFAC and OSFI, and that's a separate discussion, and UN and all of that. You don't have bad countries. You have good or bad people. And the people factor is what I think regulators need to drill down on more and become more nuanced at. This is why. In one of my first YouTube videos, I was looking at potential jobs in regulation and that I believe regulators will come to need behavioral scientists to see the SBFs of the world who are basically um, con men and sham artists. You know, that those that's the direction that I think is moving. That blog, again, like it has references to a number of things. Um, it also cite, you know, in certain instances, monetary penalties for enforcement actions aren't dissuasive. One that was in the news, JP Morgan was fined $4 million for deleting 47 million email, emails from their servers. And I was like, what absolute fresh hell is this accidental? Like, first of all, it needed to be 47 billion because record keeping is that important. I have a problem... Sorry, I'm getting a little local. I have a problem <laughs> with that. $4 million is a rounding error for a JP Morgan. And to me, that's a joke. Because if it is that I get up and I find a, a, a that's a that's a life-ending fine for a form, many of the forms. For a JP Morgan, $4 million doesn't mean anything. And if we are following international standards as regulators, when you find people for contraventions, it has to be dissuasive. That is not dissuasive soapbox. Let me get off. This is why it's a, the hashtag is passion for compliance, by the way. <laughs> so what you have happening is like a JP Morgan treating that as a cost of compliance. Serious regulators know that if you want to get their attention and stop bad behavior, you will find the people. Oh, you deleted this? 
who's in charge of this? Oh, yes, let's find all the directors. And that follows them for all of their professional career. When you find an individual, there are certain disclosures that they will then have to make to every regulator that they come up against. And this is why some regulators might be a little shy in terms of going after it. But if the breach is serious enough, yeah, go after it. Go after it. That's my view. If, if we really are serious about change and improving financial systems, that you would need to do that. But invariably, regulators are going to have to do that. So what else? Um, so the fastest five would have gotten in. You know, I'll check the background. The link for the actual, um, for the actual, where is it? Where is it? I'm looking here now. Put it. Yeah, get the done for you presentation. So if you've missed, you've missed it. And or you want to send it to a friend. That's the link for them to use. Now, as it relates to the next pres the next thing, um, in two weeks, it gives me a bit of time to sort out the next topics. And feel free to suggest topics in. We still have a bit of time. Feel free to suggest some topics for another done for you presentation. So we still have the FATF travel rule. We still have TCSPs and beneficial ownership. And what's a third one that I could drop in? It will not, let me, let me tell you what it will not be. It will not be KYC or CDD. There's an online course for that. And that actually has been upgraded with live weekly engagements. So, and that course is really like it's 14 or 15 modules. And then you have the benefit of like engaging with me, like if you have a question or anything like that. So it will not be on KYC and CDD and it will not be on in, on site inspections because that's another course, insights to the on site inspections. Essentially, it's what I would do if I were inspecting me and some of the things that I've seen compliance officers and directors do that they should not do <laughs> during it. Like if I was, I wouldn't do that. Um, and there's a bundle where you could get two of those courses for the price of one in the description and all of that. But in the next two, so next week is going to be on the weekend before the 4th of July, if you're in the U S and its territories. And the 3rd of July is actually Virgin Islands day, which is a whole thing. So, um, you know, we'll have poker run where, and poker run is fun in the, the Virgin Islands. Poker run is not card it's a card game yes it's playing poker but it's on the beach it's on the sea so you get in um speed boats or you could get in a party boat but the speed boats would enter and it's not like racing per se but you get on the boat and they can enter to take as many hands as they want i don't know how much it is to enter i've never entered as you know it would be the captains and you would sail to different points of the virgin islands and if you know what the virgin islands were set out as a number of chain of islands um, 60 islands and keys. So, you know, it would be maybe two stops in the BVI, one on Norman Island, two in Virgin Guada, and, you know, it could be one on just Van Dyke. And you stop, and it's really like a whole event, you know, at the different stops, you have different events, you could have a fashion show. And because the days are longer, sun rises at from like 5 to, and sunsets are close to 7 p.m., it's a really fun time once all is well out on the sea. So, I am definitely looking forward to enjoying my weekend wherever I am. Um, I'm seeing in the future you'd like to hear what I think of the USSEC force. Ooh, gosh, sure. I could do that. <laughs> um, I have so many issues. You know, I, I do need to travel into the U.S., but I do have issues with what the U.S. SEC is doing. And I see a bit of regulatory capture. So that's a term that is used when um, regulators seem to be kowtowing to certain persons within the regulated community. Um, it is a term that was coined in following a U.K. investigation of the former SF, sorry, FSA, Financial Services Authority, I believe, um, was it the H-Boss case? The H-Boss case was one of the cases that I think led to the separation of the FSA to the, F the Financial Conduct Authority and the Prudential Regulatory Authority. So they basically split them in two. And what's happening with the US SEC now, I think will actually cause a fracture. Like the SEC as it stands, I don't think it can survive as we know it. Um, I am also kind of quiet on Twitter but I do follow some persons on, on Twitter and on YouTube. 
And um, I've said publicly, you know, I'm, I'm into, I hold crypto now. It's going on to my third year of holding cryptocurrency. Um, and the US SEC really got my attention when they sued Ripple because as a regulator, examining the white paper for Ripple Labs and a few of the, you know, Cardano, I'm into, you know, so I stay Cardano. I'm still allowed to stay because I'm not a US citizen with Kraken. Um, Atom, Link, and these are not endorsements in terms of like buy this crypto, but because, uh, you know, I took the time to read a number of white papers that were produced by crypto firms, um, or other innovators. I even read some of the things that were published by the detractors of a particular thing. Um, Open-minded, the, the actual positioning of Ripple Labs was... It was inspiring. It was amazing, actually. And then when you look at what they're doing in different parts of the world, like those are rooms. I'm a regulator. I'm a regular, well, you know, a small island and everything, but, you know, senior enough. I have been in the room with Christine Lagarde at an FATF plenary. I can tell you that they had security from while to while. This is while she was the head of um, the IMF. I can tell you there was wall to wall security. And I could also tell you that the closest I got was 20 feet, but you have people from Ripple Labs who are basically like almost cuddled up with Christine Lagarde and, and other leaders um, in terms of regulators, Ravi Menon of Monetary Authority of Singapore, somebody I've ghosted for like, well, not ghosted in the traditional sense in dating, but like shadowed what has been happening with his career and what the Monetary Authority of Singapore would do because um, they tend to be leaders in the space in certain spaces, in my opinion. Um, and these are the players that, that Ripple is playing with. And this is what the SEC is doing to a US firm. It's madness. But I can um, delve into it um, a bit more because exchange, broker dealers, um, and a number of the other like investment houses and everything. Again, my first rodeo into regulation was in the investment business space. So I could probably do a pop-up live for that um, during the week, not in the two week slot, I'll save that for training. Um, but I'll think about time zones as well so that, you know, I make sure that since you requested it and I know you're in Ireland, I'll make sure that it's a time where you can get it. Um, so hopefully that would help. Any more comments for me? It's not often that you get to grill a regulator. Let's go for it. Any questions? I've actually been here almost an hour and I thought this was going to be shorter. <laughs> All right. I am not seeing too many in the way of questions, but yes, you want more. Um, so there'll be more do done for you. Um, I appreciate all of you for being here. I appreciate all of my subscribers and the new subscribers. Thank you so much. I am approaching a big time not milestone on YouTube, um, almost 2,000 subscribers. So if you know anybody who would be interested in this content, please share my channel with them and tell them to subscribe. It is free. It is absolutely free. I think I keep it entertaining and informative. So, you know, let me know. Um, and remember, members of Chasing Compliance get the goods, the done for you presentations will be free for them. So I'm definitely looking forward to continuing the discussion, sharing in my passion for compliance. As you can tell, I get passionate. And um, the next live, Saturday live will be, it might be earlier, actually. The next Saturday live will be in two weeks. It may be a bit earlier to accommodate the Asian time zones. Um, so Europe, Asia, Africa time zones. Um, I appreciate all of you. Happiness, you didn't say where you're viewing from, but I know where you're viewing from. <laughs> oh, happiness, are you still there? Amrika, where are you viewing from? Let me hear, let me hear from some of you before I go. waiting on you to type it in before we wrap it up. Um, but yeah, I really do hope you found it valuable today. Um, I'm going to post some stuff. And remember to always check in, like, if I'm not on, you know, it might be not be a YouTube live, but I do post quite a bit on LinkedIn. That's where I party. So join the party over there. Um, ah, 
Right here in the BVI. So you are subject to the ultra sun like the rest of us. <laughs> it is so hot. Oh my gosh. Happiness, you still on us? You still on with us? Tell everybody where you're viewing from. Don't be shy. We're going to get that roll call in early on the lives. I don't know if happiness is still on with us. I wonder if I could tell. All right, folks. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. I'm going to end the live here. Again, share the link for the offer. I'm going to drop it in the, um, the LinkedIn post on my page and on Ignis Solutions. I'm going to drop that offer in. It's so hot. <laughs> and I will definitely be catching you. Oh, and that that is only going to be up for our three days, Tuesday, Tuesday midnight. So tell your friends and all of that if they're ready to get in. Thank you so much for the love. Looking forward to engaging with all of you. And even if it is that you know, the live is ended, you can still comment. I see the comments. I reply. I, tr I basically reply to almost every, I try my best to reply to all the comments. So you can always get me that way. And guys, I'm going to get me a cold drink <laughs> because it's that hot. Have a great weekend and I'll see you again in two weeks. Bye, guys.